Providence, Divine Providence. So um, I don't know how many of you have studied anything about Divine Providence or even thought about it, but the simplest way uh, or the easiest way to understand what it is, it's, it's generally uh, the idea that God is in control of the universe and he guides everything that happens in it um and you know from his creations uh his his creation that he put on this earth including man including us uh and everything that everything is in his hands so uh that's divine providence we'll go deeper into that and um when we really understand this it, it kind of it, it brings us peace, knowing that uh, everything is in God's hand. Everything is in God's hand. Uh, he's an all-knowing God. There's nothing. I say this all the time. There's nothing that gets by Him. Um, even things that we don't totally understand, or we it, we might say, if I was God, I would do it this way. And he has a plan that we don't totally understand. Um. But he is in control. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And as usual, if you have any questions, just uh, indicate it. Let me know. Amen. All right. So uh, we're going to go deeper into what is providence. Uh, starting with Romans 8.28. Pastor Sam, would you read that for us, please? Pastor Sam, are you here? Hello? Okay. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28. Okay. So, okay. So we know that how many things? All things. Amen. Okay. All things. All things work for the good of those who love him. So that's a good uh, verse to start off with when we talk about provi uh, providence. So God's divine providence is a profound theological concept that seeks to explain God's divine guidance and, and care over all creation. So the term providence itself derives from the Latin providentia, meaning foresight or Preparation, foresight, or preparation. And it refers to God's constant and purposeful involvement. Constant and purposeful involvement in the affairs of the whole world. He's constantly and purposefully involved in the affairs of the world. Although the term is not explicitly used in the Bible, the concept of providence permeates the pages of the Bible all through the Bible. You can see God's hands on different things going on as you read. Let me stop right there. And uh, even with that little explanation that we've gotten so far, um, can you think of a time in your life, uh, a little short testimony, where you know that God was working in your life, that God had to work it out? There was no other way that this could have happened. Or you just uh, supernaturally felt the presence of God on something going on in your life. Anybody, real quickly? I have a testimony. Okay, go ahead, dear. Um, when, when I was in the hospital, when I had fallen and I couldn't get up mm -hmm. and I had to go through all the, um, like the medications and the surgery to get back to start walking. And when I first went into the hospital, I was like, I felt like it was like a darkness over me. And then my auntie and my cousin came to the hospital and they prayed for me. And mm. from that time on, me and God, we had a great connection. It was like he was talking to me. He was literally answering me. Thanks. And 
when I was praying to him, he was talking back to me. <laughs> and it was just a positive thing that he worked so many things out for me. Like I was able to walk again. I ain't have no income for six months, for over six months. And I still have my apartment to come back to. And it was like a blessing. Like when I needed somebody, I had my neighbor and my man. It was like God just worked worked for me all different types of ways. Like he brought everything together in full circles. Like the doctor, he the one who got my Medicaid and disability started because I didn't have no insurance. I mean, it was just a blessing all the way around. And I know it wasn't nobody but God. And me and I had a yes. great connection. Praise Amen. the Lord. That's Amen. exactly what we're talking about. That's exactly yes. what we're talking about. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank okay. you. Amen. Okay, so uh, the scriptures unmistakably illustrate God's active involvement in every facet of creation and human history. He's overseeing and sustaining everything according to his eternal plan. And like I, like I said, even when you might be going through the darkest time, if you just have this, this concept in, in mind and understand that God is in the darkness, God is in the storm, God is in the bad situation, don't give up. Just keep on holding on, okay? He's working things out. He's moving things. He's adjusting things. He's bringing people into your life. He's changing situations according to his will and according to his timing. Okay, so just hang on to that. So God not only upholds all things, but also directs everything to its appointed end. Isn't that good news? So he not only upholds all things, but he also directs everything to its appointed end. When I look at the word direct, I think about a director in a big orchestra and he's looking over here and he's moving his hand and he's telling this group to play, you know, a part in, in the music, in the song. And then he's looking and moving his arm and putting it all together. You know, he orchestrates everything and he makes beautiful music. So that's what God is doing. And he's able because he's omnipresent He's able to do this for someone in any part of the world. So you, you, we, you can't, we don't have to say, well, it just seems like he stays in the Middle East or it seems like he stays in Europe or, you know, God is everywhere. He's everywhere. Um, he is not a distant or indifferent deity, but a personal and loving God who cares for his creation. He cares for us. He cares for us. Okay. He reigns over human affairs and works within the laws of nature to see that his purpose is carried out. Every event, every circumstance and person in the world is a part of God's intricate plan. Wow. So that means that I am not an afterthought. Mm -hmm. You were not an afterthought. Amen. We were part of the plan from the beginning. That's why when we talk about aborting these beautiful little babies, they were part of God's plan, no matter how they got here. Or no matter the situation, mm -hmm. uh, it might have been a, bad situation between the mother and the father. But now the baby is here. Mm -hmm. Or he is about to be born. Mm -hmm. And that baby is part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. Amen. So there is no baby or no person on this earth that's an afterthought. Yeah. Or God will say, man, I really made a mistake on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pastor Yvonne, that made me think about every time I hear some like, uh, message like that, I think about Ethel Waters. Mm -hmm. She was, she was uh, go ahead. Yeah, she was conceived by rape. Mm -hmm. 
And most people say, when you're conceived by rape, you're supposed to abort the baby. Mm -hmm. But I think what we would have missed, all the uh, wonderful things that Ethel Waters did after she was born, oh, after oh. being conceived by rape. Or the other young man that spoke at one of the uh, pregnancy yes. resource centers, I mean, he was conceived by work. Now he's a teacher, a uh, speaker all over the country, and just doing all kinds of things, even though he was conceived by rape. And, you know, so was, it's not, was not an way, afterthought, yes. It's not the way you were conceived. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the, the way. So, right. uh, we have to keep reinforcing that uh, to people that we know that might be contemplating something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. okay. So nothing is left to chance. And even in the most challenging situation, uh, God's providence is at work. I'm going to show you this little video about a situation. Have you ever wondered how one keeps faith amidst betrayal and hardship? How does one remain resilient when the odds seem insurmountably stacked against them? The story of Joseph from the Bible provides a powerful illustration of just this. It is a narrative of unwavering faith, divine providence, and the transformative power of forgiveness. Joseph, the cherished son of Jacob, receives a coat of many colors as a symbol of his father's profound affection. However, this favoritism stirs a pot of envy and hatred among his brothers. They conspire against him, selling him into slavery and deceiving their father with the claim that Joseph is dead. Yet, in the face of such betrayal, Joseph's journey remains marked by a steadfast belief in God's promise. He finds himself in Egypt, serving in Potiphar's house where his exceptional abilities earn him favor. But the trials do not end there. False accusations land him in prison. However, even behind bars, Joseph's faith never falters. He becomes known for his ability to interpret dreams, a gift that eventually leads to a pivotal turn of events in his life. Pharaoh, troubled by perplexing dreams, hears of Joseph's unique talent. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams as warnings of seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. Impressed by his wisdom, Pharaoh elevates Joseph to a position of high authority, entrusting him with the task of preparing Egypt for the coming years. Joseph's foresight and leadership not only save Egypt, but also the surrounding regions from the devastation of famine. This turn of events brings his own brothers, now desperate for food, to Egypt. They fail to recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them. In a profound act of forgiveness and reconciliation, Joseph reveals his identity. He assures his brothers that even though they meant harm, God turned their actions into good, preserving many lives, including their own. The story of Joseph is a testament to the power of faith and forgiveness. It paints a picture of how God can transform adversity into triumph, guiding us towards a greater purpose. Amidst betrayal and hardship, Joseph's unwavering trust in God's promise serves as an inspiring example of resilience and grace. It reminds us that what is meant for bad can indeed be turned into good. Joseph's journey, marked by betrayal, false accusations, and imprisonment, is a powerful metaphor for our own struggles. It teaches us that our darkest times are often a precursor to a brighter future. His unyielding faith and resilience in the face of adversity demonstrate that our trials can be transformative, leading to growth, redemption, and ultimately, the fulfillment of a greater purpose. Joseph's story is a timeless reminder that no matter how daunting our circumstances, there is always a glimmer of hope and a promise of light after darkness. So when you find yourself facing adversity, remember Joseph. Remember his faith, his resilience, and most importantly, his unwavering belief that in even the darkest of times, there is the promise of a brighter tomorrow. Amen. I love that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, Have you ever wondered how one keeps faith amidst betrayal and hardship? How does one remain resilient when the odds seem insurmountably stacked against them? The story of Joseph from the Bible. I don't know why I always have a hard time getting back. <laughs> Can you all see the screen? Okay. We'll provide. It's stuck. 
the sun right now. <laughs> okay, so you can see the screen. Good. Yes. Okay, so uh, any comments on that little video? I thought it was nice. Everybody loves the story of Joseph. Yes, Joseph was a wonderful a lot story. Of people can relate to it, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, being in, uh, a member of the family that, that was not the favorite or things happen and you know so all kind of things uh, went kind of haywire uh even in the midst of that even in the midst of that hold on to god god has a plan for you uh he had a plan for joseph and what they meant for bad <laughs> god meant it for good it was god's divine providence they didn't know that. The brothers didn't know that. But that was the, the plan all along. They were trying to sell their brother into slavery or kill him, have him killed. But God yes. had the plan in that. So just remember that. Okay. Uh, Genesis 50 Verse 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's what Joseph did. He was in a position after that to save his countrymen and many people. But if they hadn't have done that, if they hadn't have been so cruel and tried to harm their brother, and get rid of him and sell sell him in slavery. He would have never been in that position. So some of us can look back on our life and some of the things that were not so great, didn't feel too great, and look at our lives now, and you, we can see God's hand hand in it. You know, in our life. And now we can see it. When we were going through it, it was hard to see. But now we can see that God's hand was in it. Maybe a, some of us got saved because of that. We were, you know, out in the world doing all kind of crazy things. And uh, we found ourselves in a, in a place of uh, darkness. And someone came along, shared the gospel, or um, you, you just happened to pick up a track. That's why tracks are so, so valuable. Just lay them around, leave them in the bathrooms, and you know when you go shopping or whatever. And somebody pick it up, read it, get saved. Your life can turn around. Mm -hmm. Amen. Any questions, comments? I would like to just comment on what you just said. Mine was Christian Television, okay. uh, CBN. Remember, I was watching. Got it. Right. We do a bout of depression, which took me off my job, and I was at home. Uh, depression, almost long story short, afraid to go out of the house, the room. Well, you know the story. But then during that time period, I get just turned on Christian television by chance and watching Pat and Ben Kinslow, Pat Robinson and Ben Kinslow. Mm -hmm. and, they was teaching people how to read the Bible. I had never known how to read the Bible. And they was talking about if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you would be saved. I had never heard that before, you know. Right. And Amen. so that's when I got saved. So God's providence had me where he wanted me to be. Well, I had to sit down and watch the Christian television. You know. Amen. Amen. Even th though you, uh, you know, were off from your job and might not right. feel sorry for yourself. And mm -hmm. man, I don't want to be here laying around, you mm -hmm. know. But God had to get you at a point where you could listen. He had to slap me down and get me ready. He said, Listen, <laughs> <laughs> listen to me. I'm trying to talk Amen. to you here. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, uh, <clears throat> wrapped within uh, the verse that we just read, within. This one verse of scripture, we see the full essence of God's providence on display. God was carefully orchestrating and guiding Joseph's destiny through his brother's betrayal. And through the years he spent as a slave and a prisoner, God was working and guiding to bring Joseph to his destiny. So that through this one life, 
he could save many. He could save many people. That was remarkable. I hope this sounds familiar because this is exactly what Jesus did for us. This is probably the greatest example of divine providence. Jesus suffered through agony and torture, carrying the full weight of our sin and giving his life to save many. Amen. In light of this, nothing happens by mere coincidence or lucky break or fate or fortune. Nothing. Remember that. But rather, everything is part of God's overarching plan. No matter what it looks like, feels like, sounds like, it's part of his plan. Uh, the extent of God's divine providence. So the Bible shows that nothing is beyond the scope of God's providential care. His divine providence extends to all creatures of the earth. Okay, we're going to read uh, part of the Psalm 104. Pastor Sam, you want to read that? Yes. The lion roars for their prey and seeks their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then people go out to their work, to their labor until evening. How many of how many are your works, Lord, in wisdom you made them all? How many are your works, Lord, in wisdom you made them all? The earth is full of your creatures. Okay, keep going. There is, a, there is the sea, the vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond numbers. Living things, both large and small. There's the ships go to and fro, and the bottom which you form to fall it there. All creatures look to you to give them their food at their proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. Amen. So God's providence embraces every living being or thing, animal or creature on the earth. And so that scripture in Psalm 104 kind of shows us how he takes care and interacts uh, with the land creatures and with the sea creatures, taking care of them, feeds them, protects them. And he does the same, of course, with us. So that's one way. I'm showing you some ways uh, of how God actually does his providential work. Another uh, way is in the material world, and that's in Acts 14, 17. Pastor Sam, you want to read that, please? Well, yes, Acts 14, 17. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provide you with plenty of food and fill your hearts with joy. Oh, he really fill your heart this, with joy, yes. And this uh, verse goes along with it, Matthew 5, 45, please. That you may be children of your Father in heaven, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. They're all his creatures. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this, uh, those scriptures in Acts and, and this one here in, in Matthew uh, shows us how God works his prevent, uh, provincial work in the material world as well. And these and other verses illustrate how even the elements and resources of the material world are under God's providential care. Amen. Any questions, comments? He's also working in the affairs of the nations. 
Uh, would you read Psalm 66, 7? He rules forever by his power. His eyes watches the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. And that's okay. what we have to think he about. Rules forever. In these last days, yes. He rules uh, forever. And he watches over the nations. Mm -hmm. He watches over them. He created, uh, that's part of his creation, the nations and every... All of the different um, subsections of our world, and he watches over everything. So yes. this verse underscores that God's providence extends to the collective destinies and paths of the nations, mm -hmm. every nation. Yes. And let me that, that may be and, let me read, let me comment on that one. And when he had told the nations to do not go against his chosen people, all of these nations that are going against Israel right now better really, really watch it for what they are doing because he rules those nations and he takes care of them and he can slap them around if he wanted to when he get ready to. But right. Going against his chosen people. Amen. Okay. Hey, the fate of individuals from birth to death. He uh, watches over that, uh, over them. So Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. Yes. For you created, for you were created in my innermost being. You did me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Okay, a very familiar scripture to us pro-life people. Mm -hmm. So he uh, um, is very profound when you really think about this verse or these verses. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I found a... a picture online somewhere uh, of a person knitting and the baby was like it was like a long stocking type thing I don't know but the baby was entwined in the knitting like God was actually knitting uh, that baby in the womb so um, it, it's just something when you think about God knitting and God creating and putting all of our parts in the right places and um, and making us. Because when I used to knit and crochet and do all of that, I was trying to make things. So he's making us. He's making the, the young baby. And then because of that, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your work's wonderful. And I know that full well, he said. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, here's another one along that same uh, a line of uh, watching over individuals from birth to death. Yeah, Jeremiah one five. Yeah, this was my son's favorite scripture. Yeah, it's a Jeremiah one five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Talking Amen. to Jeremiah, crying prophet. Okay, so he is talking to Jeremiah here, but he says this to all of us. Mm -hmm. Before I formed you, before I even formed you, before I got to the knitting part, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you because you were in my, my heart, in my mind, in my thought, you know, that you were going to be a part of my creation. So these scriptures help us to understand why life is so important. Yes. And why we don't have a right to destroy it from the cradle to the grave. And he, he, he has a plan from the cradle to the grave. And when a person interrupts that because of their evil thinking, well, that's just not good. 
So he's uh, telling us, I, before I even formed you, I love that. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Wow. Before you were born, I set you apart. I had a plan for you. I have a plan. For Jeremiah, it was to be a prophet. For you, it was to do what you do in the work that he's called you to do. You know, whether it is preaching, teaching, being a mom, working, whatever he's called to you to do. Um, he has a plan for you. These verses and more illustrate how God's providence shapes every person's life journey from conception to the grave. Any questions? Okay. Uh, he, he plays a part in uh, men's free choices, including their sins and good works. Let's take a look at this in Exodus 12, 36. Exodus 12, 36. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. They gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. Okay. All right. So the Israelites, fo Israelites follow Moses' command to borrow valuable items from the Egyptians, including jewels of silver and gold and raiment. And this act symbolized uh, both a physical and a spiritual liberation uh, for the Jews. So what's the significance of that? The Israelites plundering of the Egyptians fulfills God's promise to Abraham that the Israelites would leave Egypt enriched. It also demonstrates the Israelites' readiness for change and a new life of trusting in and following the Lord. So he he plays a part, even though we think we're doing everything on our own, you know, uh, he plays a part in the, the total orchestration or the total oversight of events. Not like every step I make, you know, God put that foot in front, you know, he gave us legs and to walk and arms, but the outcome of the things that we are involved in, God is working. When you read that, you could just see the miracle involved in that. And the, as you see the Hebrews going up and asking the Egyptians, say, well, give me that pot of gold you have over there. And the Egyptians think, why am I saying yes and giving you my goal? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, let's look at um, uh, two more verses uh, associated with uh, men's free choices. Okay. Uh, oh. Psalm 33, 14 and 15. And from his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. Mm -hmm. He who formed the hearts of all who considers everything they do. Who considers everything they do. What do everything mean? Does that mean everything? Yes. <laughs> no matter how small? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, X4. Acts 4, 27, the 28, and 28. 27. No, I'm sorry, I put that twice. Oh, okay. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. God was in mm -hmm. control, yes. So, uh, in this, so these verses reveal that even in matters of free will, even in matters of free will, God's providence plays a role, mm -hmm. okay? You want to see those again? Yes. Uh, let's read those again. Those are important. Psalm mm -hmm. 33, 14 and 15. From his dwelling place, he watches 
all who live on earth. Mm -hmm. It could be kind of scary, huh? If you're doing something wrong. <laughs> and I know uh, when I was a kid, my mom would scare me or try to get me to, you know, get my act together by telling me that, you know, God is watching you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God is watching you. So, uh, so from his dwelling, or he's writing, he's got this book and he's writing down everything you do, you know, and I, and I had this vision of this big old book, this big book, <laughs> and like, okay, he's getting that book again, so, um, you know, uh, our parents used to try to put the fear of the Lord in us, that's what we're calling the fear of the Lord. And uh, so from his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. Everything. Oh. Everything that they do, he considers everything that they do. Okay, you want to read that second one again, Pastor Sam? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, mm -hmm. whom you anointed. Mm -hmm. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And so God knew okay, they you were doing it on their own, but God was inadvertently telling them what to do. Okay, anyone else have any comments on either one of these scriptures? Do you guys understand them? Any questions or comments that uh, God is in the affairs? He watches over the affairs um, of our free will, things that we actually think we're doing um, sometimes, uh, you know, against God or against someone uh, like Jesus Christ and, and uh, the one here on X uh, conspiring to to kill him. You know, yes, they did what 28 mm -hmm. says, they did what your power right. and will had decided before should happen. So it was all in God's plan. Exactly. Even though they think that they were so big and bad that they were going to knock Jesus off and get rid of him. No, you weren't. <laughs> it was his plan for salvation for mankind. To give up his son, his only begotten son, that was part of the plan. Okay. You had something else, Pastor Sam? I was going to say what you just said. We was on one accord there. Uh, Howard, King Howard and, 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 and Punctus thought that they were being their own thing, but it was all God's plan all together there. So these verses reveal that even in matters of free will, God's providence plays a role. Amen. God's providence. I just found this picture and I thought, this kind of looks like, you know, it just kind of looks like God is in the midst and he's everywhere and he oversees everything. Everything is in his hands. I just thought that was a cool picture. Okay. So he also oversees the achievements and failures failures of man. Uh, Luke 1, 52. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Okay. He's put down the mighty, the high and lifted up, and he's exalted those who were considered maybe the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. So this verse showcases how God's providence shapes the outcome of human endeavors. That's why you never give up on yourself. You never give up on other people. You never, never, ever. Okay. Uh, prosperity and adversity. How he oversees this. Job 36, 11. And if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Mm. Okay. okay. 
All right, there's a there is a that's a blessing um type verse. Uh if if okay, if they do that, if they obey and serve him, God, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in I pleasure. Am, I am a perfect example of okay. that. So you I'm sorry. I am a good example of that. Okay. <laughs> So, um, but what that's saying is um, there is a condition. There's mm -hmm. a blessing, but there's a condition. Mm -hmm. And when you see verses like that with the if, you know, so this is what God is going to do if you do this. Mm -hmm. You got to meet this condition. Mm -hmm. uh, just like De uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the scripture that we like to quote all the time, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. So there's an if, you know, if you do all of these things, these four things, then I will uh, heal your land. Yeah. And I will bless you. So there's a lot of blessings in the Bible that you have to meet the condition first. Mm -hmm. A lot of pe people just want the blessing without meeting the condition. You have to, on this one, you have to obey and serve it. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and created darkness. I make peace and created calamity. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. That's power, right? I form the light and I create darkness. I tell the light when to shine i tell the darkness when to engulf the earth yes i make peace and i also create calamity yeah, i create hurricanes and and says, i'm the lord i do all of these things yeah. i i'm god i can do it all there's nothing out of uh my realm of possibilities to do in your life or in the life of the entire uh, my entire creation. Oh, okay. I'm, I orchestrate and I move things around. I move the light and I move the darkness around. Mm -hmm. I move the people around to accomplish my goodwill and my pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's who we serve. Mm -hmm. That's who we serve. That's why we need to give him so much respect. Mm -hmm. so I, had much a, respect. I had a good. I had a good thought. Then you mean it don't come from. Mother Nature, the light and the darkness and the storms. Not according to who I said. <laughs> I heard a lot of people when they have a storm or the light on. Well, that's just Mother Nature at work. It's not Mother uh, Nature. Okay. It's God at work. God creates the storm, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, everything. The sunshine, the peaceful breeze, everything. When you hear people say that, they're just misinformed. They need to be taught. And that's why we are being taught now. Yes. So, and, and, you, and you say things like that when you don't know. But mm -hmm. when you do, knowledge brings light, right? Mm -hmm. The entrance, the Bible says the entrance of knowledge bring, brings light. So once you learn something, it's like that cartoon with the light bulb over the guy's head. All of a sudden, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but also comes responsibility mm -hmm. because once you know something, you can't claim ignorance about something. Well, well I was just talking about that. Before that, you can, well, I didn't know. And, and you're absolutely right. And God uh, allows for that. Mm -hmm. But the entrance of knowledge, knowledge, when someone brings knowledge about a situation um, from the word of God, then you have to make a choice right there to obey it or not obey it. And it'd be wise to obey it, right? <laughs> so you make it have to make a choice because now you're not ignorant. You know the truth. Now you got to either accept the truth or you got to put it on the back burner and continue down your sinful lifestyle that you were living. So that's how that works. All right. So this verse or these verses emphasize 
that God's providence governs both the season, seasons of plenty and seasons of trial. Seasons of plenty and of trial. Okay. So why Christians should understand uh, divine providence. Why is it important to understand how God works uh, in our lives and uh, the life uh, in the whole universe and everything that's in it? Okay, divine providence reveals God's character, emphasizing his constant uh, presence, unwavering love, and meticulous care uh, for his creation. And this knowledge provides profound security and assurance, especially regarding our salvation. So when you think about God interacting in every aspect of our life and every aspect of creation and everything that's in it, um, you can understand a lot about how uh, he works in our life to eventually bring us to a point of salvation. Uh, of understanding through faith who he is, how powerful he is, and um, his divine plan also gives way to providing for us to be uh, in eternity with him one day. So all of these things that happen in our life, uh, hopefully, you know, is moving us to a point where we get to that point where someone um, uh, speaks the word of salvation. Uh, we're invited to a church. We open a Bible. We open that track um, and we begin to hear about God. We begin to hear about Jesus. We begin to investigate who is this person. Somebody gives you a testimony. Wow, that's powerful. You know, I want to know a little bit more. How, how can I know a little bit more? So all of these things are inching your way um, to salvation. And you hear that word of faith. And you say, I want that. I want Jesus in my life. I'm tired of the way that I've been handling things and the way my life is going. It's going downhill and it's going fast. And... I need some consistency in my life. I need the creator of the universe uh, because I found out about him. And I found out about all of these things that he does and cares for and he loves and the sea creatures and the skies and the stars and the moon and all of these things from eternity to eternity. You know, in every day, every minute, every millisecond, you know, he's working, and I want to be part of that, and it, and that's wisdom. Amen. Any questions, comments? Hey, let's read this Matthew 28, uh, 18, Pastor Sam. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And that is absolutely true. True, all authority. God gave uh, Jesus all authority um, in heaven and on earth. That's why we have to go through Him to get to God. You know, um, He's given that authority to His Son. We will never be in a condition where we can look directly in the face of God without Jesus Christ. Um, he is that holy, that pure. So Jesus Christ, he made a way for uh, Jesus to interact with us and the Holy Spirit to interact with us and through us to bring us to, to God. Um, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay, believers can trust that their salvation is fully accomplished for the God who saved them holds their future in his capable hands. So what that's telling us is, is 
when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you acknowledge that he is the son of God, and he died for you, was buried, was resurrected for you, then you can rest assured. I've heard people say that they're not quite sure if they're saved, you know, like they kind of wonder every once in a while, you know, am I really saved? And, you know, should I feel a certain way? Should I, I look a certain way? You know, what? I just want to be sure. Well, we all go through that, that same route for salvation. And that's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on his blood, believing what he has done, asking for forgiveness of sin, deciding that you want to walk a new way, you want to walk the way of Christ uh, to get to this eternity that, that's promised us. And God gives us those opportunities. And I uh, heard somebody say, or somewhere, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell. Because he's made a way and we have to make a decision whether to accept it or not. And when we don't accept it, then the alternative of heaven is hell. There's only two places. There's no in between. There's no purgatory or any of those places. And so God has allowed us the time, uh, a lot of us a long time. We've been on this earth a long time. We are certainly not, uh, without excuse. And that's why um, as we go through our life, then God actually puts that responsibility on us to be disciples uh, for him on this earth. And to reproduce and multiply the earth. That's not just with, you know, people born from your, uh, you know, your marriage, your womb. To reproduce and multiply the earth means to multiply yourself as Christians, more Christians. So we need to reproduce ourselves on this earth. We're not doing that. Shame on the Christians. Shame on the Christians who do not do the will of God as far as reproducing themselves and and um, uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and and uh, uh, helping people to understand salvation and how important that is. Because how can they hear without somebody telling them? Right? How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news. So those who carry the good news, and no matter how ugly your feet are, God says your feet are beautiful when you carry the good news. Okay. Um, they can have confidence, people. We can have confidence that he will complete the good work started in them, us, according to Philippians 1.6, because he is actively working in our lives and his purposes cannot be thwarted. And that's in Job 42. Put that up there. Yeah, put that up there. Let's read that one, Pastor Sam. Job 42, beginning with verse 2. I know that you could do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you said, you shall answer me. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Okay, so this is some of that dialogue. It, this is uh, uh, my favorite parts of 
uh, favorite chapters in Job where he's having his dialogue with, with God. Uh, and we all know the story. I'm not going through the book, you know, uh, teaching Job tonight. Uh, but we know that, <laughs> that uh, Job found himself kind of challenging God in a way. Um, and God had to get him straight. You know, and so this is when he started to understand uh, a little bit about the majesty of God, the power of God, because God had to get him straight and say, you know, who sets the, the, the stars in the sky and the moon or the, the sun? And, you know, he goes through all of it. He goes through nature. He goes through all of these things. It's just a wonderful dialogue starting in probably about chapter 38, something like that. Um, and so, Joe, there's a, there's a time when we wake up, I think. There's a time when, you know, our understanding becomes a little bit clear. The uh, Bible says we, we see through a glass darkly. So we'll, we won't understand totally until we get to heaven. Uh, so we kind of, you ever had a glass or a mirror that kind of got cracked or foggy? So it says in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, says we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So we there's a time when we, uh, we're, we're trying to get this together as far as our understanding understanding of what we should do and how we should please God. And then there's going to be a time when our understanding is fulfilled. Okay. I like it. Verse four, listen, please. And let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now, but now my eye sees you. And he wasn't talking about a physical sight of God. He's talking about a spiritual, his eyes of understanding. The Bible talks about our eyes of understanding, our eyes of understanding. And how do I know that? Because no one can look at it into the face of God. He is that powerful. He is that powerful. So. Any questions, comments? All right. Let's go on a little bit more. So, do you believe with your whole mind and heart that God is all powerful? Do you believe with everything in you that God is sporadically and especially present? with you? Do you believe wholeheartedly that he knows everything, even your inarticulate words and your thoughts before you say them? Do you believe that God is absolutely sovereign in all of life? Those are questions that we have to ask ourselves. And do you believe that God's providence is working in and through your life to affect your good? If so, if you believe all of those things, you have embraced the God of Genesis and the Christ of the Bible because in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. The whole fullness of God dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. So people say, how do, how do I find, how do I know God? You know God by knowing Jesus Christ. Because in him is the whole fullness of God, deity, in bodily form. Jesus walked the earth in bodily form. That's Colossians 2.9. And you are 
ready to live and you're ready to live. So, well, jury, <laughs> my little picture there. <laughs> I have my, I have made, okay, should have been, my, uh, I have presented my case, I don't know what I was trying to say, as to what divine providence is and whether it is in the Bible. I hope I have done a good job in helping you understand its meaning and its relevance. And, I'm sorry, at the heart of the matter is how much God loves you when it all boils down. Because of his great love, his divine providence is something that you that can be embraced and trusted. He has planned nothing but the best for you. And remember, he is the alpha, which means he has the first word. And he is the omega, which means he has the last word. As I close my case here, is the last word on the subject. Revelation 21, 3. And, and I, I read, I read that for you. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Amen. That's, a, that's one of the most comforting Yes. scriptures in the Bible. Yes. The tabernacle of God is with man. There will be a time when God will be with us forever. He will dwell with us. He will wipe away every tear, everything we've gone through on this earth, every hurt, every pain, every uh, bad spoken word about us and to us and all of those things will be wiped away out of our memory bank. Mm -hmm. No more death, no sorrow, no crying. That's the promise for the obedience that he's asking us to do here on this earth. Amen? Yes, very good. Amen. Praise the Amen. Lord. Any questions or comments? Turn this off here. Give me just a second, guys. Yes, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Hold on. Oh, 